name is Kristen, and you're listening to the free 2019-2020 Prophecy Series, also known as 2020 Vision, that we started last year in 2019. Today is Sabbath morning, April 18th, 2020. Make sure you always have your Bibles, and as we will be going through those, and then... Um, we will be having Q&A. So we're going to our prayer now. If you can kneel where you are, that's preferable. However, if you can't, just bow your head and God will see that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and mercy. And we ask that you be with us right now. Please forgive us of our sins. Please send your Holy Spirit to give us understanding and enlightenment, and I have that we may behold wonderful things out of your word. Be with us now, Lord. Keep all distractions at bay, phone calls, dogs barking, babies crying, whatever it may be that will keep us from hearing and learning what it is we need to know and understand. Thank you for your love and mercy. Be with each and every individual caller and those who listen to the playback and help us to retain this information. We thank you for your love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, uh, the document is in the um, Google link under the tab 2019-2020 Prophecy Series listed as number zero. Now, something I realized I should have done that I did not do is go over Clovis. I'm going to do a document on Clovis and add it in the room as a supplement. Um but we'll talk a little bit about him because he's before Justinian. So we're going to be talking about Justinian, and then we will go into Clovis. Hold on. We'll go into Clovis first before we go into the details of Justinian. Um, hold on a second. Okay. So our topic today is Justinian and his setting up of the papacy. Justinian has 714 hits in the pioneer writing of the E.G. White CD-ROM. And let me tell you how many in Sister White's writing. None. She doesn't talk about them. But she leaves that to the pioneers to do. As she says, if we want to be in present truth, read their writing. Okay. Now, if you click that link or copy and paste it into the address bar, a blank address bar, we're just going to look at when he was born, how old he was when he died, when he was ruling. He's, all, he's known as Justinian I, also known as Justinian the Great. And he was born 482 A.D., and he died 565 A.D. 482 A.D. to 565, and he reigned from 527 August 1st to November 14th, 565 when he died. Okay, so where can you find Justinian in the Bible? Well, he's referred to as a Greek emperor and the emperor of the East because remember, 330 AD, Constantine moved the headquarters from the West to the East, and now the emperors of Rome are ruling from the East. And now in 520, what did we just learn? It's 527, he starts ruling. He starts ruling in 527. And I think I'm going to put there, started ruling in 527 AD. Okay. One moment, please. Okay. He lived from, he was born, what year was he born? 482 and died 527. 482 AD and he died 527 AD. Okay, now where can we find him? Let's go to Daniel 11, verse 31. Daniel eleven thirty-one. Let's go to Daniel 11 and verse 31. Okay, actually let's look at verse 30 first. So verse 30 is when the ships of Kittim come and attack Rome, or when the barbarians of the north, now we know the Huns settled in, in Rome first in 356, And then we went over the four trumpets in detail when the wars against Rome took place. And then we learned last week that the fourth trumpet, Oda Aether, um, 
from the Ostrogoth. He si- silenced the voice of the emperor represented by the sun that, that was darkened one-third, meaning this is one-third of the kingdom of Rome that had been divided into three, given to Constantine's son, and then one-third of the moon, which represented the consul, and one-third of the stars. So that represented the Senate. We learn that Odeacer is the one who silenced the voices of the Roman government, and then he became king. Now, um, in verse 31, it says, An arm shall stand on his part. Now, if you type in arms of Justinian, there's ten hits, okay? But there's also the arms of Clovis. There's also the arms of Clovis. You have Clovis, King Clovis of France, in this verse, and you have Justinian in this verse. So let's learn a little bit about Clovis, and I am going to make a second, uh, 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 um, another document for today just on Clovis alone. It won't be very long, though. But um, King Clovis, he was born, um, let's see here, 466 A.D., and he died November 27, 511. He was the king of France. Now, France was one of those ten kingdoms that Rome was divided into. Clovis became the first to pay homage to Catholicism of these pagan kings. Now, remember, three were Arian, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals. But the other seven were pagan. And the first one of those seven that became Catholic was Clovis of France, King Clovis. In 496, A.D., he was converted to the Catholic faith. In 508, he convinced the other six, by 508, he convinced the other six pagan, the British, Spain, Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, um, oh, what are the, uh, I can't remember all of them. There were six more that became Catholic because of Clovis. So in 508, you have seven of those ten divided divisions of Rome that are Catholic, and three are Arian. So King of Clovis, King Clovis, he brings the arms for the papacy, for the Catholic Church. And in 508, the arms, or 496 prior, the arms, meaning military armies, of France has always existed from 508 all the way to 1798. And that's why we see... Napoleon able to march right in, or Berthier, the general of Napoleon of France, to march right in and take the Pope captive because France had always been the arm. Then the next arm, or military, was done by Justinian. And we're going to be learning about Justinian right now. And he was known as the Greek emperor because, remember, Greece was divided into four, and the headquarters was in the north, also called East, um, Eastern Rome. That's where Constantinople is today. That's where um, Thrace and Asia Minor was, the division of, of uh, Alexander. Lysimachus was ruling that part. Well, in 330 AD, Constantine moved the headquarters of Rome from the west to the east. So now, 200 plus years, 200 years later, we have... Justinian, who is the emperor of the East. It's still a Roman Empire, and it's still Catholic, but the emperors are in the East. And so that's why he's called a Greek emperor, because that is the Greek empire, Greek headquarters. Constantinople was where all of the Greek culture was centralized, where the education, the money, the music, the art, everything was centralized there in Constantinople prior to it being called Constantinople. Okay, so now let's read our document. Okay, Justinian can also be found in Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Let's go there. I'll give everyone about 10 seconds to get to Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Okay, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his head, the names of blasphemy. Now, brothers and sisters, when John is talking about this, he's not referring to the papacy right away. 
He's referring to the beast. Remember the papacy is the woman riding the beast. The beast is the state. The woman is the church. He's seen pagan Rome. He's seen Rome come into power right now. John has seen how Rome came into power, okay? And it says, it has seven heads and ten horns, and we learn these heads are seven forms of government. And in the days of John, it was imperial, and then it came to the papal. Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his feet and great authority. Now we're going to find out dragon also represents government. But here it says, that this beast has the mouth of a lion and the feet of the bear, but it's a whole leopard. And let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, and look. let's look at verse 6. I'll give everyone 10 seconds to get there. Daniel 7, verse 6. It says, And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard. This was the third kingdom which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl that represented the swiftness that Alexander from Greece conquered the world. And the beast had also four heads. As Alexander's government was divided into four. So this leopard represents Greece. So when it mentions the leopard, it's the whole leopard, not just a portion of it. And the reason is, is because Rome is now, the one who gave the power to the papacy was a Greek Roman Empire, deep in Greek culture, deep in the language, the education, and that's why it's represented as a leper. Okay, so let's start reading our quote. Constantine and Justinian were the two welcome to those who came on the line. The document is in the Google link listed under the tab 2019-2020 Prophecy Series. Okay, we're just starting to get into the quotes. We read some verses. Now we're getting into the quotes. Welcome to everyone on the line. Okay, so Constantine and Justinian were the two men instrumental above all others in forming the papacy and giving it civil power. The contest between Arianism and the Orthodox Catholicism was the means of enthroning the papacy. Now, Constantine is the one who united church and state, but the state, the beast, was riding the church, the woman. Justinian gave it teeth and gave what became known as the papacy, where the church controls the state, and thus you have the woman riding the beast. These were the two men instrumental, and Justinian is the one who gave it the civil power. And it said orthodox. So when Constantine moved the headquarters from the west to the east, something called orthodoxy came on the scene, Catholic orthodox. So now you have a split in Catholicism, and you have for, I think, over a thousand years plus, you have what's called the orthodox Catholics and the unorthodox Catholics. The orthodox Catholics are in the east where Constantinople is, and you had that they were Greeks, and then later Russians. Now the Russians just split from the orthodoxy of two years ago. They split a year and a half ago in like September of 2018. But they said they would be the head of the, of the orthodox church. Now in order to be the head, you have to live in Constantinople, which tells me Russia plans on taking over Constantinople as Uriah Smith and others that they would, and we'll be getting into that when we get into Daniel chapter 11. Okay, paganism and Christianity met on the battlefield when Constantine contended for the throne of Rome. Paganism and Christianity met in more deadly conflict in Alexandria, that's Egypt, where Christian and pagan schools stood side by side, and we see that in America today. Here it was that such men as Origen and Clement recognized fathers of the church, adopted the philosophy of the Greek, and applied to the study of the Bible the same methods which were common in the study of Homer and other Greek writers. Higher criticism had its birth in Alexandria, and that's where you need pagan Hebrew and Greek 
It was the result of a mingling of the truths taught by Christ and the false philosophy of the Greeks. It was an attempt to interpret divine writings by the human intellect, a revival of the philosophy of Plato. These teachers, by introducing Greek philosophy into the schools, which were nominally Christian, opened the avenue for the theological controversies which shook the Roman world and finally established the mystery of iniquity. So by teaching pagan Hebrew and Greek brothers and sisters, we are giving way to the papacy because the papacy really has indoctrinated us, especially through the strong concordance as we learned that brought in the Vaticanist definition. And this is why our churches have switched from the King James Bible just in the 80s and early 90s they were using and now use the New King James and the NIV because they've been duped into believing that they need pagan Hebrew and Greek. Okay, so from this false teachings of the world in Alexandria came two leaders, Athanasius and Arius. And this is where we're going to learn Arianism came from. Each had his following, and yet no man could clearly define the disputed point over which they wrangled. So great was the controversy that the Council of Nicaea, I should say Nicaea, was called to settle the dispute and deliver to the church an orthodox creed. The Emperor Constantine called the council, and it was in 325 A.D. Hold on a second. Give me just a moment. One moment, please. And delivered to the church an orthodox creed. The Emperor Constantine called the council and was present in person. At this council, the creed of a fast set Athanasius, Athanasius was recognized as orthodox and Arius and his followers were pronounced heretics, and Athanasius was a Catholic. But announcing a creed is one thing, and having it adopted is another. The Orthodox Creed was published to the world, and then began the fight. So this is what Constantine did. In this strife, armies fought, and much blood was shed. Please. <clears throat> but in spite of the fact that Arianism was heresy, the doctrine spread. It was popular among the barbarian tribes who invaded the western division of the Roman Empire. The Vandals who settled in Africa were among the followers of Arius, and so also were the Heruli and Ostrogoths who settled in Italy and also Mysia, Turkey. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on a second. But while Arianism spread through Africa, Sardinia, and Spain, and was present at times in Italy, the recognized religion of the Roman Emperor and the Empire itself, the Northern Kingdom, which now had its seat at Constantinople. Remember, sometimes it's a lot of times it's called the Eastern Eastern Rome, but it's in the north. Was the Catholic faith as proclaimed at Nicaea? It says nice, but it should say Nicaea. As Constantinople was the representative of this northern division of his day, so later between 527 and 565, Justinian became champion of the Catholic cause. Wait a minute, it says 565, but he died. Let me see when he died. Hold on. I've got his death wrong here. Give me just a moment. He started ruling in 527. He died in 565. I have his death wrong on the document, so let me fix that. He was died by 65. Okay. In 330 AD, Constantine removed his capital from Rome to Constantinople. The ancient city was left to the papal power, and the Pope occupied in Rome a throne higher than any occupied by the Caesars. Constantine led the foundation of the papacy, but it remained for Justinian to complete the edifice in 533 A.D. by declaring that memorable, mem memorable decree which constituted the Pope, which was the bishop in the West, the head of all the churches. The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths were of the Arian faith and opposed to the Bishop of Rome. The decree could not go into effect until 538 A.D. when the last of the opposing powers was overthrown by the armies of Justinian. And that's the arms mentioned in verse 31 of Daniel 11. But there's two arms, the arms of Clovis, 
which is mentioned four times, and the arms of Justinian, which is mentioned ten times. The city of Rome was the dragon. There we go. But in A.D. 330, Constantine transferred the seat of empire from Rome to Constantinople, and Rome was given up. To what? To decay, desolation, and ruin. No, but to a power which would render it far more celebrated than it had ever before been, not as the seat of pagan emperors, but as the city of St. Peter's pretended successors. The seat of a spiritual kingdom which was not only to become more powerful than any secular government, but which, through the magic of its fatal sorcery, was to, and remember, by thy sorceries are all nations, the sea sorceries, pharmakia, was to exercise dominion over the kings of the earth. Thus was Rome, the seat of the dragon, given to the papacy by the transfer of the throne of the emperors to Constantinople by Constantine and through A.D. 330. And the decree of Justinian issued in 533 and carried into effect in 538, constituting the Pope, the head of all the churches, and the corrector of heretics, was the investing of the papacy with that power and authority which the prophet foresaw. I mean, you can't get it in any more plain, simpler English how this happened. According to Revelation 13, 2, the dragon gave the beast his power and his seat and great authority. The work of Constantine and Justinian in gaining power for this new organization was parallel to the conquest of Cyrus, Alexander, and Caesar. Cyrus was in the news the other day, brothers and sisters. They made Sunday a day of rest in their country. In their conquest for their respective nations, the seat of the pagan Roman government was removed to Constantinople, thereby giving room for the papacy to be seated on the throne in the city on the Tiber. As territory and the capital were gained gradually, so the authority of the papacy was a gradual acquisition. Let's see here. Verse 2, And the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. And story of SDP is story of Daniel the prophet. The power of the dragon was transferred, the dragon, the imperial government, from the days of Constantine to the time of Justinian, had been supreme head of the church. You guys see that? So the government was the head of the church. The councils and bishops had been under their control. The Greek or Eastern emperors had the supremacy in the Eastern third or division of the empire. Remember one-third? Now, Constantinople was one-third of Rome because it was run by Rome. The Greek or Eastern Empire had the supremacy of the Eastern Third or Division of the Empire. What then I asked did Justinian, the Greek emperor, do but give his power to the beast when in 533 he hastened to subject and unite to his holiness the bishop of Rome in the West? All, let me put that here. The bishop of Rome in the West later being named the Pope or Papa or Father. Hold on a second. One moment, please. All the priests of the whole East. Let me start that over. What then I asked did Justinian, the Greek emperor, do but give his power to the beast? When in 533 he hastened to subject and unite to his holiness, and I put in there the Bishop of Rome, in the West, later being named Pope or Papa for Father. All the priests of the whole East. Bishop, later becoming called the Pope, became the head of the priests in the East. And also when he determined, so the Catholic Church in the West became the head over the Orthodoxy in the East. All the priests of the whole East. And also when he determined not to allow anything which belonged to the state of the Church, however manifest and undoubted that was agitated, the past without the knowledge of his holiness, whom he declared the head of all the holy churches. Also, when in his letter to the Bishop of Constantinople, he declared that the Pope of Rome is the head of all bishops, and that by decisions and right judgment of his venerable see, heretics are corrected. Likewise, when he decreed that the most blessed bishop of the elder Rome is the first of all the priesthood. See Justinian Letters and Decree, pages 86 through 87. Justin, Justinian, I should say Justinian, 
was emperor of the East, A.D. 518 to 527. He was, violent, he was violently orthodox and was supported by his nephew, the more violently orthodox Justinian. Oh, it is Justin. Excuse me. So Justinian is the nephew of Justin. And that's why Justinian came and took the throne in 527 because his uncle Justin died in that year. It was the ambition of both his uncle and himself together and in a succession to make the Catholic religion alone prevalent everywhere. Justinian's reign was the most brilliant period of Byzantine history, and that was the name of the empire in the east or the north, northeast, which later became called Constantinople after the death of Constantine. The success of Justinius was due to the services throughout the greater part of his reign of the celebrated General Belisarius. Belisarius was the army, the military for Justinian. He was the tool in the hands of the emperor for crushing out heresy. The Vandals were Arian, but Hilderis, the grandson of their chief warrior, the noted Genseric, so the grandson of Genseric, favored the Catholic faith. The emperor Justinian prepared for a war in Africa. The holy war for the extermination of Arianism was undertaken. In the year 532, Justinian issued an edict declaring his attention to unite all men in one faith. should be 533. I'll put 532 slash 533 because most books say 533. Whether they were Jews, Gentiles, or Christians, all who did not within three months profess and embrace the Catholic faith were by the edict declared infamous. And as such, that sounds like the Pope today, excluded from all employment, both civil and military. And thus, and this is the reason for our First Amendment and clauses in the amendment where they can't keep you from getting a government position if you're not any one particular religion. Between 527 and 565, Justinian became champion of the Catholic faith. The papacy arose by the aid of Justinian. And how did this happen? Let's see. The dragon, pagan Rome, gave to the beast, papal Rome, his seat, the city of Rome. Justinian, emperor of Constantinople, called the dragon, gave the Pope of Rome his power, meaning a code of laws on which his power was established and which were continued until the trench, excuse me, until the French abolished them when Italy was made a republic in 1798. And his seat, the city of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire and great authority, he made the bishop or pope head over all others, both in the Greek as well as in the Latin churches. And the Latin churches were in the west. The Greek were in the east. Okay, one moment, please. AD 533, the Pope was declared head of all the churches by the Emperor Justinian. In 533, the great emperor, Greek Emperor declared the Bishop of Rome head of all the holy churches, the head of all bishops, and the true and effective corrector of heretics. In 538, he came in possession of the city of Rome, the old seat of the dragon, and gave it to the beast or Pope, March 538, at the command the Emperor Justinian. The kingdom of the Vandals in Africa, who were also Arian, fell A.D. 533 before the arms of Justinian. Arms means armies. Hold on a second. Okay. So the kingdom of the Vandals in Africa, who were also Arian, fell A.D. 533 before the arms or armies of Justinian, emperor of the east. A war which was from beginning to end avowedly a Catholic war. No, arms of Justinian are mentioned 10 times in the pioneer section of the E.G. White CD-ROM. When Justinian first med- meditated the conquest of Italy, he sent ambassadors to the kings of the Franks and adjured them by the common ties of alliance and religion. So you see that? He went to the kings of the Franks. And Clovis was the first, he was called the son of the, the Catholic the son of the Catholic Church, because he was the first king of France, and then he died not long before, before Justinian was the emperor in the east. So even the emperor in the east recognized the kings of France 
since Clovis to be in alliance with them. And he adjured them by common ties of alliance and religion to join in the holy enterprise against the Arians. Because remember, they were also the arms of France. I mean, the arms of the papacy. The decree of Justinian, emperor of the East, declaring the Pope the head of all the churches was issued in 533. But before it could be carried out, three Arian powers, one moment please, before it could be carried out, three Arian powers, who stood opposed to papal doctrines and assumption, assumption had to be removed out of the way, namely the Heruli, which was 533, I believe, Vandals and Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths were forced into a final retreat from Rome in March 538, and Justinian's decree was carried into effect. Justinian, being about to commence the Vandal War, an enterprise of great difficulty, was anxious previously to settle the religious disputes of his capital. Justinian decided the presidency, which had precedency, meaning what came before, which had been contested by the bishops of Constantinople from the foundation of the city, which was in 330 A.D. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Give me just a moment. And in the fullest and most unequivocal form declared the Bishop of Rome the chief of the whole ecclesiastical body of the empire. The war against the Ostrogoths in Italy commenced in 534 by the same army which had conquered the Vandals. And in March, AD 538, the Pope was placed in quiet possession of the capital, Rome. Just before AD 538, the kingdoms of the Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths, through the influence of the Catholics, were uprooted. And in that year, 538, Justinian, emperor of eastern Rome, ruling in Constantinople, proclaimed the Pope head over all the churches. The fact, facts in the case are, then, that Justinian, a Greek emperor of the pagan Roman kingdom, gave the papal churches, church his seat and authority over his kingdom. The Vandals were driven out of Africa and the Goths out of Italy by the arms of Justinian. The three divisions which were plucked up were the Heruli in 493, the Vandals in 534, and the Ostrogoths in 538 AD. Justinian, the emperor whose seat was at Constantinople, working through the general Belisarius, was the power which overthrew the three kingdoms represented by the three horns that were plucked up. And... If you look at the 1850 chart, okay, go to the 1850 chart, and on the third row from the left, going down at the bottom, you'll see that terrible beast, and you'll see three horns on the left and four on the right, which is seven, and then the other three is wrapped in the papal tiara because the papacy was given power over those three territories. So the territories were never plucked up. Only the king, that's why his horns were rooted up. The king, but not the kingdom. Because Northern Africa, Africa still exists today. Mysia still exists today. It's part of Turkey. And um, not all of Turkey, but a portion of it. They control, or they did at one time control that area until um, the Ottoman Empire came on the scene. And then um, also uh, Italy is a part of one of those divisions. That's wrapped in the tiara. Okay, let me see here. I believe that the Herulian, the Vandalian, and the Ostrogothic, three of the original Roman kingdoms were subverted, and that then, by decree of Justinian, the Bishop of Rome became head of all the churches in the year 538. This was the commencement of papal power from 538 when the power of the Pope commenced by decree of Justinian, 1,260 years would terminate in 1798. The Greeks took the city from the Ostrogoths, March, March 538, at the command of the emperor Justinian, who was the Greek emperor. In 538, Rome was taken by Justinian and given to the Pope as the head of all the churches. The establishment of the papal supremacy in AD 538 in 533, the Greek emperor declared the bishop of Rome head of all the holy churches, the head of all bishops, and the true and effective corrector of heretics. In 538, he came in possession of the city of Rome, the old seat of the dragon, and gave it to the beast of Rome. Vigilius was the first pope who was seated in St. Peter's chair as the master of Rome. One moment, please. Between AD 533... 
when Justinian published his decree recognizing the head of the Roman diocese as head of the government of Rome. So here we see the woman being placed upon the beast, the, the government. And AD 538, when the last obstacle in the form of a rival power was taken out of the way in Italy, the woman mounted the beast. Do you see it right there? There you go. It tells you right there. The woman mounted the beast. I've been teaching this, and I just, I don't remember reading this quote. I must have read it because, but the woman rides the beast. I'm going to put that in Revelation 17. And also the quote where Constantine, the government had always controlled the church. But here we see the woman rides the beast. When the woman mounts the beast, that's the papacy. Let me see here. The judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, and this happened in 538 A.D. Catholic Church given power, hold on a second, to rule over the government. And that is in Story of Daniel the Prophet. No, Story of the Fear of Patmos, page 397. Let me find out what paragraph. And that is in Stephen Haskell's book that we're told to read. Okay, let me see here. Story of the Seer of Patna, 397. I need to get in the pioneer section. Story of the Seer of Patna, 397. Okay, let me see here. That's not it. Yeah, am I in the right page? Let me see here. Guided and controlled by a prostitute. Okay, it said, AD 538, when the last obstacle in the form of a rival power was taken out of the way in Italy, the woman mounted the beast. Henceforth, lordly Rome, which, like Babylon of old, had prided itself upon the fact that it was the master of the world, was guided and controlled by a prostitute woman. Hold on a second. Guided and controlled by a prostitute woman. Let me see here. Guided and controlled by a prostitute woman. I'm sorry. It's page 296, paragraph 2. I don't know why I have 397. 296.2. And let me write that in my book, in my Bible. 296. Ooh. 296 in his first book, Story of Daniel the Prophet. you got to read that page as well. There's a parallel. This is powerful. Okay. Prior to 538, 533, 538, the beast mounted the woman. The religion of Rome was secondary to its government. That is, the state was the one all-absorbing institution, although religion was subservient to the state. And that is Story of Daniel the Prophet, page 208, paragraph 1, and 208, paragraph 2. Okay. Okay. And then it says, the balances denoted that religion and civil power would be united in the person who would administer the executive power in the government and that he would claim the judicial authority both in church and state. This was true among the Roman emperors from the days of Constantine until the reign of Justinian when he gave the same judicial power to the bishop of Rome. Now the power of the emperors are transferred to the popes making the church head of the government. Imperial Rome fell about A.D. 457, I mean 475, 476. Some say 483. Hold on a second. And was in the hands of the barbarians. Thus it continued till the conquest of Rome by Belisarius, Justinian's general, 530 to 538, when the Ostrogoths left it in possession of the Greek emperor, March 538. Thus the way was open for the dragon to give the beast his power and his seat and great authority. Revelation 13.2 The fact from Revelation also settles the point. This fact from Revelation also settles the point that the Pope did not receive his power from Clovis, king of France. It was the dragon that gave Rome his power as head of the churches. The Roman emperors had stood at the head of the churches with power to make important decisions for the church. It is now transferred to the Pope, and he has given him also great authority under the Justinian Code of Laws to judge and punish heretics. One moment, please. Give me just a moment. One moment, please. Okay. 
Thus, the way for the papacy's 1260-year was formed. The Western Roman Empire had been broken up into ten kingdoms, and the way was now prepared for the work of the little horn. Number one, the Western Roman Empire had been broken up into the ten kingdoms, into ten kingdoms, and the way was now prepared for the work of the little horn. Number two, in the early part of this century, the Bishop of Rome was made head over the entire church by the Emperor of the East, Justinian. Number three, the dragon gave unto the beast his power and his seat and great authority. From this ascension to supremacy by the Roman pontiffs date the time, times, and dividing of time, or 1260 years of the prophecies of Daniel and John. The rise of the papacy, the little horn of Daniel. Mr. Miller claimed that the 1260 years of the papacy were to be reckoned from 538 by virtue of the decree of Justinian. This decree, though issued A.D. 533, did not go into full effect until 538 when the enemies of the Catholics in Rome were subjugated by Belisarius, a general of Justinian, meaning one of the armies. From 538 to 1798, when the beast received its deadly wound. From Rome ruled by the popes, received its power seat, the city of Rome, and great authority from the preceding symbolical form, the dragon, when Justinian, the imperial ruler, located in Constantinople, proclaimed the Pope head over all the churches. Hold on just a moment. This beast received a deadly wound in 1798, just 42 months or 1260 prophetic days. Afterward, when the soldiers of the French Republic removed the head, the Pope, and carried him into exile where he died. The events which took place in the year 1798 are strong evidence that my calculations of these numbers are correct. Papacy then lost the power to punish heretics with death and to reign over the kings of the earth. All must agree that papacy has no temporal power over any kingdom except the little kingdom of Italy. One moment, please. One of the horns of which the ten are composed. It is very evident, too, that the churches church is now not now in the wilderness and the time times and half of the church in the wilderness were fulfilled when free toleration was given to all religions in italy france spain portugal etc the 1260 years are fulfilled after the orthodox put down the arian heresy in italy and the west by belisarius the general of justinian's troops sent into africa and italy for the express purpose of suppressing the arian power and giving the Church of Rome the preeminence over all schismatics. Then was the Bible taken from the common people and remained in a sackcloth state from A.D. 538 until A.D. 1798 during 1,260 years. Wow, that was powerful. That was, it explained it in such detail. Praise God the way it was put in order here. But it was put in such detail simple details that we know how the dragon gave the beast its authority. So this is just, and we know why it's called a fool leopard, because at the time, um, Rome was, was ruling from the east, which was a Greek province, was all steeped in Greek culture and the language. And oh, this is powerful, brothers and sisters. I hope it was a blessing to you as it was to me reading this. This, this really... Everyone need to hear this. Okay, so we're going to be getting into the papacy and, and that sackcloth that's being mentioned where the word of God is covered. How did that happen? What did the papacy, what rules and laws did they make between 538 and 1798? Even a little prior to that, the Catholic Church. But we're going to see what the papacy did. And, and what year, all of the years are in place. You don't want to miss it. So we're going to look at Papacy Part 1 today. And then next Sabbath, we'll look at Part 2 in the morning. And then we'll get into Trumpet Number 5, which is Woe Number 1, dealing with Islam. And how God used, um, it's still the Papacy ruling um, in Constantinople, the Catholic Church in the East. Okay? We're going to be looking at how God raised up, we learned the first four trumpets was a scourge against pagan Rome, and now we're going to look at the last three trumpets that have woes connected to them 
that are the scourge against papal Rome. Okay, if you have a question or comment, let me make it to where you can unmute yourself. Okay, so we went over some powerful information, and if you have a question or comment, please place yourself in the queue. Now, I noticed, okay, Sister Ella, you're in the queue. Did you have a question or comment? Sister Ella, you're in the queue. Did you have a question or comment at this time? My, my comment is, oh, it is beautiful how you brought this all out. I'm glad I have studied to uh, ask this study on this. I can understand everything you were explaining. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. And all glory to God. This is whatever order yes. I put it in because the Holy Spirit told me to. Yes. And so it just, it is. Reading it today, it's just like, wow. It, it just, it makes it so clear. Okay? It does. So now we've got yes. it to 1798. So now we're going to backtrack and go into the history of the papacy. Okay? Okay. And and we're going to find out how the Ottoman Empire was the reason France was able to go into the Vatican and take the Pope captive because the papacy had depleted its funds by warring against um, the Ottoman Empire. And we're going to be learning about that. So we're going to learn how the Ottoman Empire, Turkey being the head, was responsible for Rome in the east being defeated and and kicked out of Constantinople in 1453. Um, We're going to be learning how they're the reason Columbus discovered America, because remember Columbus was supposed to go to India, and when he got here, he thought he was in India, calling the native people Indians, and that was because the Mohammedan Turks, after they conquered Constantinople, closed off the Indian passageway preventing Columbus from sailing over into India. And we're going to learn how the Ottoman Empire, with the Turks at the head, how they are responsible. They were the ones actually in power of a large portion of the world in 1798. They were controlling a large portion of the world in 1798. So we're going to be looking at some fascinating stuff that you guys definitely do not want to miss. Okay, so thank you for your comments. Sister Juanita, I saw that you were in the... Oh, she looks like she left. Sister, okay, Juanita left. She was in the queue. Does anyone else have a question or comment this morning? Sister Sharon, Sister Priscilla, Sister Aida, Sister Renee. Do any of you guys have... We had 10 people. We have seven now. Does anyone have a question or comment? Sister Sharon, do you have a question or comment for us this morning? Good morning. Did you enjoy the study? I did enjoy it. I have some questions about what you said. Okay, I know that the woman, and and I saw it in um, the document, sitting on the beach represents the papacy. And so I'm still kind of confused about where it talks about the dragon gave the beast authority. I know Mm -hmm. that beast represents king or kingdom. So with the dragon be represented as Justinian giving um, its power to the papacy? Yes, and let me read to you from Sister White. Uh, Let me see if I can remember which book it is. Testimonies, Volume 838, where she says the dragon also represents governments and kingdoms. And let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Let me find it. Hold on. I'm trying to remember. Dragon King, let's see here. Okay, it's in Testimonies to Ministers, and it's at the top of page 39 before you get to the first paragraph. And it says, Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God, and who have faith of Jesus. Remember Miller's rule. A figure can have more than one meaning. And and also, we see that a lion represented Egypt as well, and not just just, uh, Jesus, not just Assyria, and not just Babylon. But here we see that dragon, we know it represents the devil first and foremost. Right, right. But then we're told it represents Rome. 
okay? Then, according to the prophet, and you can read about that because let's go to Revelation 12 to prove that it represents Rome. Let's go to Revelation 12 and let's look at verse 3. And when you're there, let me know. I'm there. It says, verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Now, this is not referring to the devil. This is referring to Rome. And verse 4, And it can refer to the devil, but it also represents Rome. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child. Question. When Jesus was born, who tried to kill Jesus? Herod. And he was a representative of Rome, was he not? Yes. So the dragon not only represents Satan, but it also represents the kingdom Satan worked through, but it also represents kings and rulers and governors. So remember Miller's rule A figure can have more than one meaning, okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. All righty. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, I have another question, but it was from uh, your topic on the destruction of Jerusalem. Could I ask that now? Can you do what? Um, You did on Tuesday. I wasn't able to be there. And you did um, a talk on the destruction of Jerusalem and the close of probation. I have a question. Okay. Um, my question you know what is would be about... better? Because I'm sorry. That would be confusing for here. It would be better okay. to ask that question on Tuesday. Okay. And you can, send me, you can send me a question prior to it. I can answer okay. it for you. And then I can, okay. I can ask a question on Tuesday. All right, okay. That good. I kind of don't want to mix the two up. Okay. I understand. Okay. 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 Any other Thank question you. or comment? No, it was that one about the dragon because I knew it was representative of Satan, but I remember the rules that it can have more than one meaning, and that made sense yes. with the Revelation chapter twelve. Yes, and um, it also represents okay. Rome, but in the end of time in Revelation. Let me see, is it twelve seventeen where it says and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war? Sister White says this represents kings and rulers and governors. Oh. So not just any one particular government, not just any one particular king. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Okay. okay. Hello? Uh huh. That's referring to verse. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Sharon. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Sister Jenny, did you have a question this morning? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, well, more of a statement. I didn't get um the documents in my Google Drive. Okay, you have to click the 2019-2020 prophecy in the Google link. And you should have the prophecy tab. Um. Uh, I don't think I have that link. Okay, I've sent it to you three times, two or three times. You should have it. It's the it's the link mm-hmm. for the medical missionary training. When you click that link and you go in, there's other tabs available. You you don't mm-hmm. have it. So what you what no, you need to do is email me a request, and this time please put it in a safe spot somewhere in your email. Title it Christine's. Uh, MMT and prophecy training, and then you'll have the link at all times. You'll be able to find it. Find it, okay. Because I did email right. it to you. I mean, I emailed it a couple times. Okay. 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 It must have got have lost any... in my email. No problem. Okay. But you're going to have to make a special folder for it so you can find it very easily. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. Do you, does anyone else have a question or comment question. this morning? Anyone have a question or comment? Okay. Sister Aida or Sister Renee, did you guys have a question or comment? Remember, we have people calling, or not calling, some are calling, but others are listening to the link, to the playback link. Any questions or comments this morning? Okay, Aida, did you have a Uh, question or comment? No, well, yes. Uh, Actually, my question was uh, that, 
um, the same question Sharon asked. Um, and Shannon or Sharon? Sharon. Okay. About uh, Emperor um, Justinian being called the dragon. So um, she asked what I had been thinking, and you answered that question. So it was clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm-hmm. And that's why we have these questions. That's why Q&A time is so important because it yeah. helps clarify and those things will pop up in other people's minds as well, but they're too prideful or embarrassed to ask because they feel like they look stupid by asking or they want people to think they know it all. I've met both cases, and therefore they really don't know the answer. But And we're, no question is a dumb question. And we mm-hmm. have to swallow our pride and realize we don't know it all. I don't know it all. I'm learning every day. We're going to be learning throughout eternity. So questions Mm -hmm. are so important. So thank you. Did you have any other question or comment this morning? No, that's it. It was, uh, I learned a a lot. So I have to reread it and soak it up some more. But uh, I I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we know also the beast is representing the kingdom of Rome in the West, and the dragon is representing Justinian in the East. Because it says, verse 1 of chapter 13 of Revelation, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So who had ten, seven forms of government? Who, had, who was divided into ten? That was Rome. But the seventh head was the papal head. So this is referring to pagan Rome, then turning into papal Rome. So the beast here is referring to pagan Rome in the West, that was divided into ten, and the dragon is referring to the emperor in the east. Is that making sense? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Makes it very clear. Huh? Yes, thank you. It does. Yes, and you guys don't want to miss when we're going to get into the papacy part one today. Any other questions or comments? Isn't this stuff fascinating, guys? Did you see how we just went through these studies? We just covered the details. And now we're going to get into the history of the papacy, and then we're going to get into how the Catholic Church in the East, where Justinian and Constantine were, how they were taken over under the second woe by the Turks of the Ottoman Empire um, in 1453, and how they were kicked out of Constantinople, which is now occupied by the Turks, in 1453 and remember that territory is called the north not just the east because it's referring to the east as far as it's east of rome but it's in the northern territory of alexander's divided kingdom okay any other questions or comments this morning any other questions or comments area code 540 did you have a question before we hang up does your precious offspring have a question before we hang up any other questions Any question or comment at this time? Okay. Well, we'll be back at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 3 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Central, and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. Christine. Oh, hi, Renee. Oh, Kayla wanted to comment. We had it muted. We couldn't figure out why you didn't hear us. (laughs) Okay, okay. I just wanted to comment um, about the Greeks. Uh, I think it's really interesting how much of an influence that the Grecian Empire had and even still has on today's society, uh, all of the learning and the things that they came to teach are still such an influence in today's present history. Amen. And that's why when you look at verse 2 of Revelation 13, it says in the beast, referring to pagan Rome, which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Only a portion of Babylon, only a portion of Medo-Persia, but the whole shebang of Greece. And we're told this is why there was no profit between the time of um, Medo-Persia in 360 B.C. all the way to John the Baptist in 27 A.D., 26, 27 A.D., And Rome existed for a hundred plus years prior to that. But it was because of the influence of the Greeks, they were not able to comprehend and understand. So, yes, 
and it influences all the way down to today's day. Yes. So yeah, thank you for that comment. You're welcome. Yeah. So you see it's the whole body of the leper, not just a portion of it. Yes. Mm-hmm. All of it is yes. very important, influential. Yes, and that body, that whole, by it showing the whole body of, of the leopard, which represents Greece in Daniel 7, that shows that Rome was steeped in everything of Greek culture. It yeah. wasn't just the speed of uh, the conqueror, uh, Alexander the Great. It was also the speed of learning that the Grecians yeah. put out, too. That's right. They are considered to be the most educated people ever to this very day that was ever on the face of the earth. But, of course, we know that was a secular education. Yes. yes. <laughs> and yes, some of so that is still you. taught in schools today. <laughs> Absolutely. In all the schools, it's taught, unless you're homeschooling. It's even taught in our Seventh-day Adventist schools, unfortunately. So yes. did you have any other comments or questions this morning? I just thought it was all really great, so interesting. And praise the Lord that he gives us all of this so that we can understand and know all of this, this wonderful light. Amen. So that our feet can be grounded on the rock securely so that our foundation is sure amen amen and so that we can stand this test that is to come later on amen amen well thank you for your comment much appreciated so we will be finishing here so god bless everyone until we meet again may the good lord bless and keep each and every one of you hope you see you'll be back 2 p.m this afternoon bye-bye